everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to present to you Conifer, which we've spent the past few months building. My name is Aina, and my teammates are Sam, Ahmad, and Lawrence. I'm going to walk you through the introduction, use case, and potential solutions. And then Sam will talk about using Conifer, benchmarking Conifer, and the algorithm. Ahmad will then talk about the behind the scenes of how Conifer works. Finally, Lawrence will talk about the implementation challenges we face and future work for Conifer. So let's get started. What is Conifer? Conifer is an open source framework that allows developers to easily deploy an infrastructure that runs Cypress tests in parallel. Conifer reduces the total time it takes to execute a full test suite for local development. Conifer's aim is to encourage developers to run a full test suite as frequently as needed during development. In order to appreciate what Conifer does, we have to understand some basic ideas on how testing works. So what is testing? Testing is the process of evaluating and validating whether an application is functioning as designed and meets the requirements. Testing also helps reveal any bugs in the application that can then be fixed accordingly. Testing can be done manually or with automated tools. As applications grow in size and complexity, manual testing of applications is not sustainable. It doesn't scale well, and it's a slow process of diagnosing a problem and creating a fix. How do we know that this fix doesn't introduce new problems or break other parts of our software? Well, we need to test again. Here's where automated testing helps. Instead of manually going through each test case by hand, developers can write scripts that execute the same test steps automatically, which can be reused over and over again. There are many types of tests that developers can write but we'll only cover the three main types of testing. First, we have unit tests. At the most granular level, unit tests typically focus on a small individual part of an application, which checks whether that code functions according to how it was designed. Unit tests are written to be independent from other units within a program. Unit tests typically take a short amount of time to run because of this. In a typical test suite, it's recommended to write more unit tests because it helps developers with validating code, refactoring code, and it's the easiest test to write and takes the least amount of time to execute. However, the disadvantage of a unit test is because it only tests a single unit of work, a passing unit test doesn't always mean the code will work as expected when other dependencies are introduced. Next, we have integration tests. Unlike the independence of unit tests, Integration tests verify that your code can work well when multiple parts of the program are integrated together. Integration tests typically live at the edge of your applications since they connect to an external resource like a file system, database, or REST API, or more. Because of this external connection, they are slower than unit tests and they can be more difficult to write. Compared to unit tests, a passing integration test gives a higher level of confidence that code works when integrated together. The third type of test is end-to-end -end test. It's called end-to-end -end test because the application is tested through the user interface to replicate real-world scenarios from start to finish. Real-life user scenarios can be hard to implement from a unit test perspective. On the other hand, user scenarios are fairly straightforward to reproduce when switching to an end-to-end -end perspective. End-to-end -end tests are written and executed using established testing frameworks that were built for it such as Cypress. End-to-end -end tests aren't perfect. For the advantage of simulating real-world scenarios, the disadvantage is that end-to-end -end tests usually requires a lot more effort to write. It's more difficult to maintain, and also it takes a lot more time to execute. Traditionally, end-to-end -end tests are used much less due to how costly they are to execute and maintain. However, investing in end-to-end -end tests is usually something that pays off very quickly. Modern testing frameworks like Cypress were designed to make it easy for developers to write tests. Because of that, more and more companies invest in using end-to-end -end tests for their modern apps. With end-to-end -end tests, we have an even higher level of confidence of catching bugs and regressions before they make their way to a production environment, which is known to be costly in terms of company image, developer time, stress, and overall development team productivity. 
Now let's take a look at the hypothetical use case. DroneOn is an autonomous delivery platform on its way to success in Silicon Valley. DroneOn has easily impressed investors and secured their next set of funding for expansion. With its current small user base and prototypical nature, the developers have been able to get away with more basic front end and less than ideal test coverage. A wider reach is going to come with greater demands for better UI, but with that, it will be more likely for bugs to occur and the app is going to need a far more comprehensive set of test suites. Drawn On's front end application is built using React and utilizes Cypress for their integration tests and end-to-end -end tests. They chose Cypress because Cypress tests are designed to be written in JavaScript, which is familiar to all Dronon's developers and due to how easy it is to learn how to use the tool. On commit, Dronon's continuous integration tool automatically triggers all of the Cypress test suites. However, developers also run these tests locally on their own machines between commits as progress checks as well as to maintain the efficacy of the end-to-end -end tests so that they can continue to get a high quality and faster feedback loop for their work. These local test runs have historically taken minutes to run, but with the newly refined UI and test suites, they are now taking up to half an hour. As a general rule, we want our code to fail fast and fail often, meaning that we want our code to be tested as early as possible in the development process. We want to fail quickly so that we can begin the learning process as fast as possible. And we want our code to be tested as often as needed so that bugs are fixed soon after they are introduced. If testing the code takes a really long time, it becomes less feasible to fail fast and fail often. When a test takes a really long time to execute, the developer's productivity is disturbed as they wait. Eventually, developers often have to decide between running less tests or context switching to another task to make use of the waiting time. This type of environment has a hidden cost in the form of developer time, stress, and overall productivity. This problem is only getting worse with every refinement to the UI and test suite. According to this research by National Institute of Standards and Technology, the cost of software bugs removal increases, increases depending on where it is found. Note that the cost here is being expressed in developer person hour dollars. As we can see in the chart, if a bug is found at the requirement and architecture and coding stages, it is still relatively cheap to fix them. But as you go on to find them in later stages, such as the integration testing and system testing stages, the cost increases dramatically. If a bug made it to the production environment, they can cost up to 30 times to remove them. This is the reason why failing fast and failing often is an effective testing strategy. Fail fast and fail often also means failing for a cheaper price. If all developers in a company like Dronon test less and less during the coding phase, the more likely it is for bugs or error to become more integrated into the code and to be found and fixed later. Knowing this to be a common problem and knowing the company's image is on the line at this critical growth phase, Dronon is looking for ways to minimize the risk of this snowballing effect as much as they can. Now let's try to understand what are some options that Dronon can look into. Initially, testing used to be executed sequentially. Each subsequent test would run after the previous test was completed. While initially sufficient, this approach has become less optimal as applications continue to grow more complex and distributed and testing has become more resource intensive. Executing tests in parallel became one common solution to this problem. Parallel, parallel testing allows for the execution of tests simultaneously in multiple environments in order to reduce test execution time. As you can see, the following test suite has five, ta five tests that take roughly five minutes to execute sequentially on one machine. By parallelizing the tests between five machines, where each machine executes one test, it can potentially cut down the testing time to a fifth. Now that we've seen the potentials of parallelizing tests, let's take a look at what options exist for parallelization. First, Dronon can look into developing local test parallelization. Testing in parallel on a local machine is a feature that developers often implement themselves to speed up their testing. It is important enough that some testing frameworks offer test parallelization out of the box. 
Unfortunately, Cypress doesn't support localized parallelized testing. Secondly, even if this option was available for Cypress, this approach is limited by the developer's computer's performance. It only benefits the developer if the computer is powerful enough to run parallelized tests locally. With that, DroneOn can purchase more powerful computers for the developers. This approach is limiting since computers can only get so powerful before it becomes really expensive. We also shouldn't forget that we need to be able to run parallelized tests locally in the first place to best benefit from these more powerful machines. Next, there is also the options of using cloud-based servers to execute the test in parallel. Developers can choose and manage servers that are powerful enough to execute the test. Parallelizing tests require two major components, an infrastructure that is powerful enough to execute the test in parallel and the logic to split the test between the nodes. In both local and cloud-based solution, it requires infrastructure know-how to manage it and to integrate the test orchestrator together. Building a DIY solution is not easy. It would require develop developer time and effort to build, time and effort which could be better off spent developing business logic of DroneOn's application. Next, DroneOn can also look into purchasing a subscription for cloud-based testing services. Cloud-based test services usually provides an easy plug and play parallelization for the developers. It has the benefit of being highly scalable and being able to test on different types of browsers and on many different mobile devices. However, this usually comes at a high cost. So DroneOn now starts to explore these potential solutions in more detail. Let's now discuss the potential solutions DroneOn explored. Firstly, let's take a look at existing cloud-based SaaS solutions. This approach includes solutions such as Lambda Test, Browser Stack, and Sauce Labs. They are full-featured cloud-based testing software as a service that provides automated testing of desktop and mobile applications. These enterprise solutions offer manual testing and automated testing on virtual machines and real devices. They also offer compatibility with various testing frameworks and integration with popular CI CD tools and comprehensive test overview and dashboards. This makes them a feature rich service that would allow drone on to deploy their tests timely. They make it easy to deploy and use their platform so DroneOn's team doesn't have to invest time into building and maintaining the system and focus on their business logic. However, by exporting your application to a SaaS like Sauce Labs, the trade-off is a lack of data ownership. While the offerings are attractive, a small company like DroneOn with only a handful of developers and in a critical growth phase where they are, there are a lot of uncertainties, it would be difficult to commit to an enterprise solution with a monthly subscription fee that is beyond what they can afford. They would also like to keep their data on their own infrastructure and not on a third party host. On the other side, drawn on Steam could build their own solution to parallelize their tests across any number of instances and generate a report at the end of the test run, all the while maintaining full control over their infrastructure and data. Drone on would have full control over the feature set and be able to customize it to their specific needs. But this would require a significant amount of time and resources to build from scratch when their time can be better spent on working on their core business product. Having built the infrastructure, they would also need to spend the time and resources maintaining it. In addition, drone on could integrate their DIY solution with Cypress dashboard or Currents.dev dashboard, um, an alternative dashboard for Cypress. Both are full featured dashboards that support parallel testing designed to be integrated with their choice of CI provider. The CI is typically only configured to run tests at specific times, such as on commit or before a merge. It is considered a more reactive approach, kind of like a safety net, rather than having their developers execute their tests whenever they are able to. However, if the engineering team wants to use these options to parallelize their tests for use during local development, they will still need to build their own infrastructure and integrate it with the dashboard. Lastly, we have Conifer. 
Conifer was created for companies or developers who want a simple way to spin up their, their own infrastructure to run Cypress tests in parallel and fits into the needs of drone on Steam. It's easy to set up. Conifer provides a simple CLI to build, deploy, and tear down AWS infrastructure while providing a simple live dashboard to view while tests run in parallel. A company like DroneOn will be able to maintain full control of the infrastructure and that, that is deployed to AWS and can scale up or down as they see fit. With Conifer, a company will have to pay for the resources that they deploy to AWS, but there are no upfront payments. While this cost can increase depending on the usage, it's possible to increase or de decrease capacity based on their testing demands. The low upfront cost and ability to control the cost based on usage makes Conifer a cost-effective alternative for a company like DroneOn. However, Conifer is not nearly as feature-rich as a SaaS solution or customized DIY platform. We designed Conifer's open source testing framework to fill this niche. Now that we've seen the potential solution, I'm going to pass the presentation to Sam to talk about how to use Conifer. Thanks, Ina. So in order to use Conifer, the user will need to have Node, NPM, AWS, CLI, and Docker installed. Uh, once Conifer is installed, user runs the command Conifer init. This starts a series of prompts where the user is asked questions about their specific application, such as how many parallel nodes do they want to run? It can be four, five, six, whatever is suitable for the application, and what type of EC2 instances to provision. They're also asked other questions about their specific app. Then with these responses, Conifer will install the dependencies it requires to run. Next, the user ensures that they have a Docker file for their own app and runs Conifer build to create the necessary image for Conifer to run. The Conifer build command then uploads this image to AWS Elastic Container Registry. This command prepares the app for execution in Conifer's parallelized infrastructure. Provisioning the infrastructure is made easy through Conifer's Conifer deploy command, which automatically initializes the AWS infrastructure needed to run tests with Conifer. With the image and infrastructure set up, all the user needs to do is run tests using Conifer run. The user can monitor the progress of their tests with the dashboard and is relaunched automatically. Lastly, if the user is finished using Conifer and wants to remove all the cloud infrastructure that was previously built using Conifer deploy command, they can type in Conifer teardown. This removes all AWS resources except for the image and ECR and the database unless otherwise specified. So far, we've introduced Conifer, discussed how to use it, and who might be interested in using it. At this point, you're probably wondering how much Conifer can speed up end-to-end -end testing. In this section, we're going to examine some of the results one can expect when using Conifer to parallelize their Cypress end-to-end -end tests. Let's start by comparing the total test run execution time for test suites of different lengths with our local machine versus with Conifer. Now, keep in mind, there could be variation in local test run durations depending on your local machine specs. For reference, the device we used here was a 2021 MacBook Pro with an M1 Max chip and 32 gigs of RAM. On the first row, we have a small test suite that takes around seven minutes to execute when run sequentially on the developer's local machine. Running this test suite on the parallelized infrastructure provided by Conifer results in an execution time of around five minutes. Then on subsequent runs, the execution decreases further to four minutes and 35 seconds. Next, we have a medium-sized test suite that takes 21 minutes and 35 seconds to run locally. The same test suite takes a little over nine minutes to run on Conifer initially and seven and a half minutes for subsequent runs. Finally, the last row features a somewhat larger test suite. This test suite takes around 36 to 37 minutes on the developer's local machine, but only around 12 minutes when run with Conifer. For subsequent runs on Conifer, it shaves off another two minutes off the total runtime, resulting in a total execution time of just under 10 minutes. These results, while impressive, also reveal two key trends. First of all, the degree to which a test run is sped up depends on the length of the test suite. More tests means a more significant speed increase, both in absolute terms, as displayed right now, and in relative terms, as shown by the run speed multipliers now appearing in the final column of the table. 
The greater speed improvement for longer tests can be explained by the relatively fixed startup time per Kana or for run, a delay that doesn't apply to running tests locally. This delay takes up a greater proportion of the runtime in the case of shorter tests, but since it is fixed as the test length increases, it takes up a diminishing proportion of the test run duration. As you can see in the above table, as the test suite length progresses from small to large, the initial run speed multiplier progresses from 1.39x to 3.09x, and the subsequent run speed multiplier progresses from 1.55x to 3.88x. Fortunately for our users, this means that the most agonizing test suites are the ones that get the biggest boost in speed. The second trend is that subsequent runs tend to be faster than initial runs. This can be explained by Conifer's test splitting algorithm that utilizes metadata from previous test runs to optimize future runs. More on that in a moment. So we just witnessed a glimpse of how Conifer can decrease the time it takes to run a test suite dramatically. Now let's explore how Conifer achieves these results, beginning by exploring how Conifer's test splitting algorithm works. Conifer allocates test files to parallel nodes using a two-stage algorithm. The first stage is utilized in the initial test run. During the initial test run, Conifer naively distributes test files to the various nodes based on the total file count, such that each container contains roughly the same number of tests. For example, let's say that we have a test suite that contains consists of eight separate test files. This test suite is to be parallelized over four nodes. The algorithm will go through each test one by one and add it to the node that contains the smallest number of test files. This process will continue until all the test files have been allocated. Though the stage one algorithm splits the files evenly amongst the parallel nodes, it does not necessarily represent the most efficient splitting of the test suite. This is because it can result in different nodes having longer total run times than other nodes due to the possibility of certain test files taking longer to run than others. For instance, you can see in the image on the right that even though each node has the same number of test files, node one takes much longer than node two, which is a problem because the test run is only as fast as the slowest node. This brings us to stage two of Confer's test allocation algorithm, where the test files are allocated based on timing data. After the initial run, Conifer persists metadata about each test file including the amount of time each test takes to run. On subsequent test runs, Conifer can then use this test data to allocate the test files such that the difference in total test time between each parallel node is minimized. Using the same test suite as the previous example, beginning with the longest running test, the algorithm will go through each test file one by one and add it to the node that contains the smallest estimated total runtime rather than the one with the fewest test files. This process will continue until all the test files have been allocated. We can see this process play out in the animation on the left. As we can see from the graph on the right, this will result in nodes that take a similar amount of time to finish execution relative to the naive allocation on the previous slide. To recap, on the initial test run, test files will be allocated such that there is an even division of test files among the parallel nodes. On subsequent test runs, the timing data from previous test run will be utilized to allocate tests among nodes based on total test time. It is noteworthy that the naive algorithm will be responsible for the majority of the speed increase. This illustrates the power of parallelization, making it such that the user can enjoy substantially reduced test suite runtime from the very first run. And now I'll pass it off to Ahmad, who will talk about how Conifer is implemented. Thanks, Sam. So, so far, we've witnessed the extent to which Conifer is able to speed up end-to-end -end testing. We've also examined some of the algorithms that allow Conifer to divide up the test suite in a manner that facilitates achieving these speed increases. Now, we're going to go uh, behind the scenes to take a deeper look on how Conifer is actually implemented. Before we talk about the specifics of Conifer's implementation, it would be helpful to define the various responsibilities that have to be fulfilled in order for Conifer to function. At a high level, these responsibilities can be divided into five different categories. The first, setup, refers to the preparation of all the tools that are going to be used to tackle the following responsibilities. We also need to be able to orchestrate and direct the testing process, ensuring that the correct functions are performed at the appropriate time throughout the process. We also need the ability to execute our test suite in a parallelized manner. We need to be able to store the results that are generated from each test in some form of persistent storage. 
And finally, we need to communicate the results of the test run to the user in a useful manner. We're going to begin with setup. What actions need to occur to fulfill this responsibility? Before we can run any tests, we need a blueprint of sorts that specifies all of the files and dependencies that are going to be required to run the user's application and its associated end-to-end uh, -end testing suite. In other words, we need a blueprint for a single node in our infrastructure. This blueprint is later going to be used to create the nodes that make up Conifer's parallelized testing infrastructure. How can we create such a blueprint? For Conifer, this blueprint is going to be in the form of a Docker image. Docker images are files that function as a set of instructions that can be used to build a Docker container. What is a Docker container? It's an executable package of software that is going to include everything that is needed to run an application. Running our nodes as Docker containers is going to make it such that we can run our app and its associated tests on uh, any computer that has the physical requirements to um, run our software without having to worry about configuring the correct environment. This is going to dramatically simplify the process of deploying the user's application on general purpose cloud computing infrastructure. So now that we have our blueprint, let's discuss the provisioning of the infrastructure. At its core, Conifer relies on the power of cloud infrastructure to fulfill uh, its use case. Like any tool that relies on, relies on cloud infrastructure, we must first provision this infrastructure prior to using it. Provisioning the necessary infrastructure is accomplished through, through the use of AWS's Cloud Development Kit, or CDK. And the graphic on the right is, illustrates an example of this process. Executing the CDK code is going to dynamically synthesize a cloud formation template that is going to detail the specifications of the specific infrastructure components that need to be provisioned. The information provided in the initialization process is going will be used to tailor these specifications to a specific end user's needs. AWS is then going to use this finished cloud formation template to complete the provisioning process. So here's a look at the architecture so far um, that handles the building and building the image and provisioning the infrastructure. The next responsibility we want to tackle is the test orchestration process. Within Conifer's architecture, the command line interface, or CLI, is responsible for handling the test orchestration process. The CLI fulfills this responsibility by supporting uh, the following functionalities. Um, it's able to initiate the testing process. It tracks the status of a single test run as it uh, proceeds. And it's able to trigger the recalculation of the test groupings, the way the test files are split amongst nodes at the appropriate time. So what process needs to occur to successfully initiate a test run? At a high level, we need to be able to, one, start up the nodes that run our test suite. We need to be able to find a way to, specif to specify what portion of the test suite, what specific tests each node is going to be running. We need to be able to link a specific node to a specific test run or a specific instance of using the conifer run command. And finally, we need to be able to uh, reference or access each node for tracking purposes. So how does a CLI fulfill these stated requirements? The CLI initiates a test run by using AWS's software development kit. The software development kit is going to uh, be used to trigger tasks on AWS's Elastic Container Service, which is going to be the service that actually runs the containers that are going to execute our tests. Each of these tasks spins up a container using the image we had pushed to ECR earlier. And when we actually initiate these tasks, we're going to specify certain container overrides in the form of environment variables. And these environment variables are going to allow us to dictate the specific test files that are going to be run on a specific node, as well as um, allow us to attach a node to a specific test run via putting in a test run ID. Also, upon initiation or the completion of initiation, the specific uh, resource identification numbers for the tasks that were initiated are going to be persisted in the configuration file 
And these later on are going to be used to track the status of a specific task. So at this point, we've successfully built our image, provisioned our infrastructure, and initiated the testing process. And now our tests are executing on the various parallel nodes. While this process plays out, there are certain things that we're going to need to be able to do on a regular interval, such as check for new test results as they appear on a persistent store, and continually monitor the status of the test uh, run to be able to know when it is concluded. This process is also going to be accomplished using the AWS Software Development Kit. At this point, the test run um, is already executing, and the SDK is going to be used to check up on the status of the specific tasks using the task resource identification numbers that were persisted in the configuration fire file at the earlier point. Additionally, while the tasks are executing, the user dashboard is going to be launched, and this is going to allow the user to track the progress of the test run in real time. So our tests are initiated, um, and we are able to track their status. At this point, um, the test run has concluded, and we need to be able to recalculate the test groupings. What steps have to occur to enable this process to play out? First, we need to actually retrieve the timing data from the persistent store, in this case, um, metadata from DynamoDB, which we'll go more into in a later slide. Once we have this timing data, we need to run the stage two of the algorithm that was discussed earlier. Um, and this algorithm is going to generate the new test groupings. And then finally, um, we need to save these new groupings for subsequent for the subsequent test runs inside the configuration file where they will be read and used um, on the next test run. So here's a look at the architecture so far with the components that handle the test orchestration process. Now let's take a look at the specific tasks that need to occur to actually execute the test suite, meaning the actual code that represents the tests. Zooming in on a single node, three actions need to occur in order to successfully execute our test suite. We need to be able to initiate any necessary background processes. We need to initiate or start up the application that is going to be tested. And once this application has started up and is ready to go, we need to start Cypress and execute the specific tests. So zooming in on a single node, let's examine the flow of the testing process. Upon spinning up the container, the node level testing process is initiated by a shell script that lives within the container. The first thing the shell script does is initiate a file watcher program, which we will discuss in detail. Following this, the user's application itself is going to be launched. And since it's critical that the user's application be active when uh, Cypress is run, Further execution is going to be stalled until the user's app is fully started. And finally, once the user's app is up and running, testing is going to be initiated by launching the Cypress framework. And here we will use the task level container environment variables that we specified earlier to tell Cypress which part of the test suite we want to run on the specific node. So with the completion of these three steps, a subset of the total test suite is now running on a single node. This is a look at our, our infrastructure thus far, which includes the components that are required to run the code for our tests um, within these various tasks that represent each a single node. The next responsibility that has to be handled is persisting the test results that are generated uh, when each test file is run. After execution, we need to store the actual results of the tests in some form of persistent storage. This process can be divided into two main steps. First, we need to be able to detect when test results are available, when they are actually generated after a test has complete. Next, we'll need to be able to save these results into some form of persistent storage that is outside the nodes of the testing infrastructure, so it can be accessed later. That takes us to our file watcher. Before we discuss the file watcher, uh, let's briefly recap 
the concept of testing artifacts. So each Cypress test is going to generate test artifacts upon completion. And these artifacts, such as um, JSON, metadata, videos of the test itself, as well as screenshots at specific points of the test, um, they provide an accounting of everything that occurred during the execution of a single test, as well as information about any failure. And these artifacts are invaluable for understanding how a test was executed, as well as debugging any potential issues or failures. The file watcher program lives within each parallel node, and it runs in the background on each container. It's going to be responsible for detecting when a testing artifact has been generated, which usually occurs upon test completion. And it's going to do this for watching, or it's going to do this by watching for changes in the directories where the Cypress artifacts are saved. And these are a set of, stati of standardized directories, such as the results, videos, and screenshots directory. Whenever the file watcher detects that a newly created file has finished saving, it's going to upload that testing artifact to the appropriate directory uh, inside a conifer's S3 bucket. And additionally, the file watcher program is going to parse certain artifacts, and it's going to pull from those artifacts, select metadata that it's going to save to our object database or document database, DynamoDB. So here's a look at our infrastructure now with the um, DynamoDB S3 bucket that into which the test results are going to be persisted. And let's briefly recap the process so far. We begun by um, performing the setup process and provisioning all the tools that we are going to need. We initiated a test run, oversaw the execution of each test file in the test suite, and extracted all of the resulting test artifacts into persistent storage. At this point, let's discuss how we might communicate the test results back to the end user. The process of returning the results to the user can be broken down into three main steps. First, we need to be able to retrieve the test results from where they're stored. Once we have them in one location, we need to be able to apply some form of processing to transform the data into a format that is easy for the user to understand. Finally, we want to display this uh, data to the user via some graphical user interface. Conifer handled this responsibility um, in two ways with two separate infrastructures. The first of which was a live dashboard, which uh, communicated the res test results to the user in real time as they occurred, but in a less, in a more limited form. The other approach, um, it, HTML report generated upon completion of the test run, um, provided a detailed accounting of every uh, thing that occurred in the test run. Beginning with the live dashboard. So the live dashboard utilizes data that's persisted by the file watcher and um, uploaded into the Dynamo database to keep the user up to date on the status of the test run. It consists of an Express backend and a React frontend. If we recall, as the test is executing, the CLI pulls DynamoDB uh, for updates on the status of the tests. And when it finds that there are updates, it will send these to the dashboard uh, via a webhook. The live dashboard is then going to display these uh, updates to the user as they come in. And by doing so, it enables real-time monitoring of the progression of the test run, allowing the user to monitor stuff such as the status of a single test and the duration of each test whether the test has started, failed, and so on. The user dashboard is also going to provide links to download individual test artifacts from the S3 bucket as they become available. And these are things such as screenshots of any failures or videos of the entire test, as we can see in the animation. The other way we communicated the test results to the user was uh, via generating an HTML report at the conclusion of the test run. In order to do this, uh, we had to first complete uh, two prior steps, and that is retrieving the data um, from the S3 bucket, aggregating it into a single file, and then saving that file to the user's project directory. Once created and saved, the user can open the HTML report, um, and they can see a complete accounting of everything that occurred in the test, status of each individual assertion, what passed, what failed, 
and any other data that they would have had access to had they run the entire test suite locally. So um, this is a final uh, bird's eye view of our infrastructure, uh, and it shows all the components we just illustrated that are going to be used to fulfill the responsibilities that need to be done for Conifer to successfully run. So now I'm going to pass it on to Lawrence, who's going to discuss um, some of the important design decisions we had to make, as well as challenges we faced during implementation. Thanks, Ahmad. So we've talked about the responsibilities, the architecture, and how we built Conifer. Now we want to take a closer look at two of the main challenges we faced and why we chose the approaches we did. We thought these challenges warranted further discussion. Specifically, how do we execute the tests in parallel, and how do we retrieve these results from the nodes? We want to focus specifically on how to perform parallelized testing on the cloud after the consolidated Docker image has been built and sent to ECR. So now the user's application is on the cloud. How do we run the tests in parallel in a parallelized manner? Our first thought was to use Lambda functions. Lambda is an event-driven compute service that lets you run code without needing to provision or manage any resources. We had envisioned using Lambda functions as a way to parallelize the test executions, where each Lambda function can execute each test file in the test suite asynchronously. Thus, the concept would be to invoke n number of Lambda functions where each function runs one test file in the complete test suite. Lambda has many characteristics that make it uniquely suitable for our use case. Firstly, it possesses the capacity for infinite parallelization, so it is highly scalable. Secondly, it represents a fully managed solution, so there's no need for us to manage the deployment of, of AWS resources. Lastly, it's a proven solution. This approach has been used to successfully parallelize end-to-end -end testing on Selenium, which is another popular testing framework. Aside from these upsides, there are a few drawbacks. First of all, the Lambda container size limit is an issue. This used to be a bigger problem when the size limit was 512 megabytes, but recently it was increased to 10 gigabytes, so it is more suitable for applications. In any case, we thought it was sufficient to support applications under that 10 gigabyte limit. Second of all, the Lambda function timeout is only 15 minutes. In theory, it is an issue. But because of infinite parallelization, it is highly unlikely that a single Cypress test file will take more than 15 minutes. And last of all is the cold start time. Cold starts vary based on what the Lambda function is running. It could be an issue, but we would have to validate it with real world data. You may have already noticed that Conifer's architecture that we, we didn't use the Lambda functions to parallelize the tests. This is because we encountered an issue relating to how a low level display driver dependency that Cypress needs to run and it had conflicts with running on Lambda. This issue appeared to be unsolvable as there still is an open issue on GitHub directly related to using Lambda with Cypress, which dates back to 2018. We explored a handful of workarounds that attempted to bypass this problem. These were typically very complex and always implemented, were always implemented to support the testing of a specific application. None of the workarounds were intended to be used as part of a general purpose testing infrastructure. Therefore, they were not suitable for use with Conifer. Since using Lambda was a dead end, we needed a way to run our tests. Elastic Container Service, or ECS, has a few characteristics that make it desirable for our use case. Being a container orchestration service for Docker images, it is able to run our nodes. Additionally, it is easily it can easily be scaled in a manner that will allow us to sufficiently parallelize execution of our test suite. Thus, it is able to fulfill the same responsibilities that we had originally envisioned using, using Lambdas. Unlike Lambdas, which are serverless, ECS offers two launch types that we can use to run our nodes. The first option is the self-managed solution using an EC2 instance as a task runner. ECS also offers a serverless, fully managed solution called Fargate. We took the bottom-up approach by trying to get Cypress to work on EC2 instance. We conducted initial development with EC2 as a task runner with an immediate goal of ensuring that nodes are able to run and that the same problems with Lambda did not apply. Using EC2 as the task runner made it possible to take advantage of the relative ease of debugging and troubleshooting in a self-managed solution for the initial application development. Ultimately, we decided to stick with using 
EC2s as our task runner. In addition to simplifying the development process, EC2 task runners achieve the substantial speed gains that Conifer aimed to provide for ETV testing. Implementation with a fully managed solution via Fargate was deferred as a future optimization. To summarize our first major implementation challenge, we needed a way to parallelize the test on the cloud. We first explored using lambdas to parallelize the test and saw the advantages and disadvantages. Then we discovered there were underlying issues with running Cypress on Lambda. We then explored using ECS and its two launch types, and we investigated its pros and cons before ultimately deciding to go with the EC2 route. So now that the tests are being run in a distributed environment on the cloud through EC2, let's take a look at the test results of these test runs. But how do we do that? Normally, the user could view the results of their tests in real time through their terminal. Because Confer is executing tests on the cloud, they lose this feature. What's the point of testing if you can't see the results? Is there another way to view the results besides the terminal output? We can create a test report for the user to see these results through an HTML report after the test run is complete. Although, this, is not to, this will not let them see the tests in real time as they are executed. This can be achieved through Cypress with its built-in reporters. Unlike viewing the test, the test results via the terminal's output, these reports can be retrieved and sent to the user. When the user gets the report, there is a minor problem. The reports are generated per each test file, which means the user has to go through hundreds of reports to see their test results. We managed to solve this problem easily by using a custom reporter plugin called Mocha Awesome, which creates the reports and has a feature to aggregate them. Before we can aggregate the individual test results, we need them to be in one location. So let's take a look at the current situation. This graphic illustrates the situation after our test suite has finished execution. As we can see, the test results were produced for each test, but they reside in the node where the, specified, where the specific test file was executed. Therefore, we don't have access to them and we cannot use them to generate a report for the end user. In order to send any results to the user, we need to first solve the problem of retrieving the test results from individual nodes, placing them into one centralized location. The easiest approach would be to defer uploading the test artifacts until after all of the tests in on a single node have finished running. The conclusion of test execution on a node implies that the Cypress test runner has finished running, and thus that all of the artifacts have been generated. Running a script after this to upload the test artifacts would be a trivial process. But this is not good enough. We want Conifer to be able to communicate these test results to the end user in real time, functionality that is present when running the Cypress test suite locally. Accomplishing this requires us to retrieve the test results from each individual node in real time as those test results are generated. So how can we achieve this? Let's take a look at two main approaches. At the high level, we can approach this problem in two ways. We can, we can attempt to insert the desired functionality directly into the test execution process. So the tests are uploaded immediately after the test file runs, but before the next test begins. Or we can create a new process which has the sole responsibility of uploading test results as they are created. For the synchronous approach, can we configure Cypress to upload the results in between each test execution? For the asynchronous approach, is there a way to detect if test results have been generated? If so, can we upload that result? The first approach would be to di direct Cypress to synchronously upload the testing artifacts for a single test file immediately after that file finishes running. Within this the Cypress config file, we have the ability to specify code blocks to be executed at certain points in the testing process, including subsequent to the completion of an individual test file's execution. This approach is complicated because of the potential for existing code in the end user's Cypress config file, some of which may be critical for supporting the proper execution of their test suite. Thus, the necessary code would need to be stitched into a pre existing config file in one of two approaches. First, by directing the user to add in the necessary, necessary code themselves or by injecting the necessary code ourselves. However, this approach is a no-go. 
The alternative of parsing the user's config file and injecting the necessary code is risky given the complexity of the Cypress config file and its importance to successfully execute the end user's test suite. The second approach would enable the asynchronous streaming of the testing artifacts through the implementation of a file watcher program. This program would be separate from the Cypress test runner and would run in the background asynchronously while the Cypress tests are being executed. To function correctly, the, Cypress, the file watcher program would need to be able to detect when a test artifact has been both created and fully saved. Once these conditions are satisfied, the file watcher would initiate the process of uploading the specific artifact to, pers to persistent storage. This approach would require no additional work from the end user, but it is more complex and it constitutes an additional point of failure in the testing infrastructure. We decided that the implementation of the real-time streaming of testing artifacts would be best achieved through the use of the asynchronous file washer program. Both of these approaches achieve the necessary functionality. The first approach would be undesirable because it burdens the end user with stitching together the configuration files. This is especially the case because they may not, they may not even be able, they, they may not even be familiar with the configuration themselves. This makes the asynchronous approach a non-starter. Although the file washer program was more of a technical challenge, it supports the necessary functionality without requiring additional work from the end user. Now, let's talk about future work for Conifer. In the future, our team would like to investigate other test allocation algorithms that may be useful to the end user with certain use cases. One such algorithm is due to dynamic allocation of tests. This, the animation on this slide illustrates the approach. Rather than calculate test groupings prior to initiating a test run, this approach would dynamically allocate tests by utilizing a queue of sorts to feed the tests to the nodes as they become available. This approach may prove useful in situations where accurate and or up-to-date timing data is not available, such as during the first test run and in frequently or rapidly changing test suites. Additionally, we want to investigate Fargate as a task runner. There's potential for a lambda-like parallelization if the kinks can be worked out. We would be able to realize the benefits of a fully managed serverless solution. The remaining points are some features that we could potentially increase the efficiency of testing for developers when testing locally. We want to implement a fail fast feature where we have the option to stop test execution as soon as the first failing test is found. We also want to add flaky test detection where the developer can test, can detect flag and track flaky tests. Lastly, we also want to add analytics on the live dashboard to give users a richer experience on their test results. This is the end of our presentations. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, so I have a question from the audience. It says, the recalculation of test groupings, so well, that's clever. Can you talk a little bit more about how the idea for this algorithm came about? Does anyone want to take this one? I'll go ahead and uh, take that. Thanks, Anna. And, uh, yeah, appreciate that, Audrey. Um, so there are a few ideas uh, around that algorithm. And um, one concept behind it was that we needed some sort of pointer uh, towards whichever node had the minimum uh, amount of total test time so far, just so we know where to most effectively add uh, additional test time to uh, in order to optimize or most effectively equalize the distribution of test time between the nodes. And then um, another aspect of it was that we want uh, the decision to order the test files in descending order by test time. And the reason for that was because as we added uh, these test files to these nodes, we wanted to make finer and finer adjustments in uh, test time addition uh, to each node with the idea that we would converge to a more equal solution between the nodes. Uh, because if we were doing it in another order, we would uh, not be converging to a more equal solution. It would be easier for us to um, have uh, a, a more unequal solution at the end there. I'm not sure if that answers your question completely or if that was the spirit of the question. Um, uh, let us know if there's more we can answer there. Thanks. Great. 
Uh, we have a, another question. What was the most challenging and the most exciting part of working on Conifer? Um, yeah, I can say something for that. So I guess let's start with the most exciting part. Um, so Conifer, we can really, the nice thing about Conifer is when it, when we got it to work, we can, we would know right away because we would see that a test suite that, you know, for example, took 40 minutes, all of a sudden runs in let's say 10 minutes. So when we finally hit that point and um, we went ahead and ran this test suite, deployed it, and we got back this result that made it such that it was run four times faster. Um, that was, that represented a very exciting part and like validation of our concept uh, and all the hard work that was put in. Um, the most challenging bit, something that was particularly challenging, and I'm sure this is a common thing, is um, figuring out how to appropriately um, set the permissions, um, the security groups and roles between all the various portions of the infrastructure. Um, at times it felt like, uh, you know, an endless search, you know, we fix one thing, uh, the next permission, you know, doesn't work anymore. Every time we wanted to add something new, we had to go in there and, you know, completely rewire the connections and make sure everything had the correct uh, permissions in order to do what was a otherwise minor, you know, change to our application code. Um, as time went on, uh, we finally mastered the general principles behind, um, you know, the permissions. And this became much easier, but in the beginning, um, it was a very significant time drain and, um, you know, was probably, especially at the very start, the most challenging thing that we faced. Thanks, Amat. Um, we have more questions. Very neat how Conifer speeds up subsequent test runs. Was that feature planned from the beginning or added on once you had a v v version one working? What was it like working on it? I can answer that. I think it was definitely planned from the beginning. Um, we noticed uh, like a few other offerings, like the SAS ones that we talked about, like Sauce Labs. They offer something like this, and we thought it was a very doable approach. It was something that we could do. And we saw like a few other approaches in designing the algorithms. and. So it was definitely one of the more fun portions to work on and compared to working on like what Ahmad said, like working on the AWS CDK stuff. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, more questions. Were there any interesting discoveries as you were initially investigating overcoming the driver issue with Lambdas? Hmm. I have an answer for this one. Um... Or I, I know, were you going to go? No, wait, it? take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, interesting discoveries. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of interesting things that we came across while uh, trying to figure out how to get past the issue with the lambdas. I'm just going to mention two real fast. Um, one was the, so we found a solution that was um, more or less like completely mapped out, but the nature of the solution was it was so low level. There were so many steps involved and like not really any explanation of what was happening. Um, more or less anyone that was trying to attempt it um, and was like responding to the author of the solution couldn't figure it out. And these were, um, you know, experienced software engineers with many years of experience in some cases. Um, so taking a look at that, you know, there was definitely a very brief moment where we were trying to implement it, but we had to take a step back because um, all of these people that were struggling to implement this solution were trying to do it just so they could test their specific application. And for us to try to implement it in a way that would work with any person's application, um, we just, we deemed that to be a, you know, very bad idea. And it was like a wake up call that it's time to move on. Um, another interesting, uh, this is more of a funny thing we saw uh, and on a similar vein, as uh, what was what I um, was just mentioned is uh, a funny GitHub issue uh, title or open issue where someone was like this specific issue essentially is ruining my life and job and like it was very a many page long rant of everything they've tried 
Um, so yeah, seeing that also was a pretty good indication that, you know, maybe this wasn't the way to do it. Uh, we have more questions. Can you can you talk a little bit more about how the file watcher was implemented? I can take it also. So Don't worry. Else, one else. Yeah. Um, so the file watcher, um, the I guess at its core, the file watcher it wasn't. Um, it's very basic functionality. It wasn't uh, too complicated of a thing to implement. Um, the challenge came was um, for figuring out how to the correct time to upload um, an artifact that was generated. So specifically, this was a problem for videos. Um, the way that Cypress was saving the videos, it would create the file um, like at the start of the recording, essentially. Um, but at that point, you know, that doesn't contain um, what is going to be the complete video. And at the end, it would conduct the compression process on this video. So uh, something that was significant, a significant challenge with the file watcher was figuring out how to determine the appropriate um, time uh, at which this video would be ready to upload. A lot of the times in the initial implementation, it would be uploaded and you know, we'd go ahead and try to play it from our dashboard. And, you know, it was a corrupted video file indicating that it had saved um, at a different time or at the wrong time. So, yeah, eventually we figured out that um, we would determine that the video has finished um, saving by tracking the, like, files that were being generated by Cypress uh, almost um, adjacent to the video being finished, like different metadata that was going to be put in as part of the final result. And once all those were erased, it was an indication to us that Cypress had finished creating the video. And that's the point at which we can upload it. OK, I think we're out of questions. So I think that concludes our presentation.